Okay, here we are, we're live. Ah, spectacular. So uh, one of my dearest uh, friends, even though we haven't spent so much lifetime together over the years, but uh, Paul Keller, you are an international phenomenon and it's so <laughs> great to have you on You've Got Mel. Thank you, Mel. It's so great to see you moving around and talking. Usually it's it's uh, in an email or in, in Messenger or some way on Facebook. And I, I love Facebook just because I've been able to stay connected with you for the last 10 years. And, and likewise, my friend, and it has been 10 years. Uh, Unbelievable. When I first met you, it was to come to Tel Aviv to play at the uh, Israeli National Opera House, right? Mm -hmm. Nitzan Kremer, our friend Nitzan brought us there. I love Nitzan and I love Facebook for staying in touch with Nitzan. Hello, Nitzan. I hope you're there. Thank, thank you for everything you did for us. Yes, and thank you for introducing me to Paul Keller. <laughs> the first time I came to Tel Aviv was with Eddie Higgins. Amazing. That's when I, that's when I met you the first time. Yeah, amazing piano player. And then the second time I came was with my own uh, young piano player friend, uh, phenomenon, Steve Richko. He was only 33 years old when he came there. And it was hugely life-changing for him. Sadly, the, the next year he died. Yes, he was a marvelous a piano player and great guy. Yeah, and a few years later, Eddie, Eddie Higgins died too. So they're yeah. both gone now. But what beautiful memories from being in Israel with those guys. So, so you know, uh, we got already talking, but we haven't done the jingle. So uh, I'm going to play the jingle. Whoa, I want to hear your jingle. Absolutely. Don't be critical of the music. Just, in, just, in, <laughs> just enjoy it. Okay, here we go. Okay, I got to get rid of this thing. Oh, okay. nice. We're ready to roll. Get a chair, grab a seat, or we'll sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got Mel. Ease your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got Mel? When the show begins, you better hold on real tight. Or before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down, we're the only show in town. SRO, don't you know you got Mel? Give it up, don't think twice, we're a hurricane on ice. What the hell, give it yell, ring your bell, show and tell. Mademoiselle, give a smell, you got Mel. You've got Mel. And Mel has Paul Keller. What yeah, I love it. <laughs> I can just see you sitting in your easy chair at night going, Mel, swell, tell, go to hell. <laughs> Mademoiselle. Well. Mademoiselle. That's fun. Do you like to write lyrics like that often? Um, I write lyrics occasionally, um, but uh, then I write the music. And the, I can send you one or two things, but I'm not in your league. Oh, I would like to check it out. You know, I've, I've always been a bit of a composer. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an inventor of some kind. And my mother suggested music because you can always invent something new with Are you music. Serious? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've started at the very beginning. So you're you're a um, you're a guy from from uh, from where? From the uh, Midwest? Yeah, from Michigan. I, I'm in Michigan now. I've I've lived in Michigan all my life. Although I've been fortunate in jazz to travel the world many times. Not in the last four months, though. <laughs> Nobody's done much. <laughs> so, so you know, um, not everybody decides to become an international jazz phenomenon, string bass player who uh, gigged with, uh, with Anna Krall and appeared at the White House. Uh, not everybody uh, gets those opportunities. Uh, how, did you, how did you grow up? Why are you so nice? And how did you become a bass player? <laughs> that's great that you think that I'm nice. I guess I must owe that to my, my great mother and father. Sadly, my father uh, passed away at Thanksgiving, uh, but my mother has been living here with us on and off, 
And that's been a great joy and uh, honor. And uh, we do stuff together every day. So that's really, really great. Your, she, your father was, was a clergyman. He, he was, yes. For 43 years, he was a United Methodist minister. So I grew up in the church. Lots of music around me all the time. They were both musicians. My father, the minister. My mother had various jobs, but basically she was just the world's great greatest mom and stayed at home and played a lot of piano, gave me some piano lessons, which I tried to, my hardest to ignore. Well, you played really well. Well, I... Uh, at, the I beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm watching you and I, I say to myself, Paul is playing the piano backwards. So either, uh, yes. either he has a backwards piano in his house or something's wrong. <laughs> no, I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, figured, I figured that out on, on uh, boy, I've learned a lot in the last four months about all kinds of stuff that I didn't want to know. All of us, all of us. Yeah, so now I, now I know how to turn, turn the camera around so that it looks, uh, it looks the right way. Um, yeah, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Actually, we, we, my father being a minister, we lived uh, in, well, during my youth, we lived in five different towns in Michigan, in western Michigan, near Lake Michigan, which I don't know if you know, it's a, it's almost like an ocean. Hey, I, I'm Canadian, eh? Oh, yeah. 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 So you know about the Great Lakes. So I lived over there, and my first gigs were when I was, uh, uh, I'm going to say, 16 and 17 because yeah seven, 16 because well, when I, said, I, have, I have to rewind you here yeah what, what made you decide when you were i don't know 11 or 12 to pick up the string bass you know many famous uh, musicians um took up string bass because um that was the instrument left in the in the in the uh, in the band yeah the only one left right well I played violin when I was uh, uh, about six. And then we moved and I lost my teacher. And so I kind of gave it up for a few years. But then in fifth grade, my mother took me to the band and orchestra meeting. And I can still see it. They had all of the instruments laid out there on the floor, the saxophones and the trumpets, and just so the kids could see them. And in the corner stood the string bass and it was calling to me. So I think it, I think it kind of chose me and uh, my mother rolled her eyes and she said, okay, if that's what you want. And so we were doomed. Uh, our family was doomed to driving station wagons for the, <laughs> forever then <laughs> just to accommodate the string bass. Yeah, and you know. uh, yeah, so I played, I played uh, the string bass in, uh, in junior high, high school. I went to the university of Michigan. I played in the symphony all the way along Loved that very much. I loved my classical lessons. I loved playing the classical repertoire to the degree that I got a chance to. Uh, but then came a time when I was about uh, 19 or so, I thought, I got to, I have, I'm going to make a decision. And my decision was that I did not want to play in an orchestra. I did not want to play uh, classical music as a living. And I don't know what possessed me except for all of the great experiences I had when I was 16, 17, and 18 playing jazz. I was probably a little bit too romantic about it. But that's the, that's the course I, I chose. And Paul, you're a romantic person. I guess, I guess so. Um, so it, it's turned out pretty well. I'm not rich, but I'm rich with friends, and I'm rich with songs, and I'm rich with jazz language and i'm rich with good stories and lots of great memories of travels and meeting people like you and oh a thousand other people like you and doing all kinds of things that i know i never ever would have done without jazz music so i guess i made the right the right choice of course you made the right choice yeah um and uh, before we talk about the diana crawl and international fame um, why don't you go over to your string bass and we'll play something. But we, we, we need another song. Yeah, you know, that, that was not a bad one there that we just tested. Okay, and folks, 
yeah, we just really, found something. I know, but that's that's the favorite song of my of my string bass player in Israel. Oh, what's his name? Tom Peleg. Um, Tom? I, Tom Peleg. He's he's a wonderful bass player. Not I'm not comparing him to you, um, but he's in Israel and you aren't. Um, and uh, we played together, and I, I've learned really uh, because of him primarily to uh, love bass so much that I can do a whole performance just vocal and bass. Sure. So, so we're gonna we'll do that, and we'll we'll do that. Um, what's the song called? You know what Ray Brown said. You know what Ray Brown said. Music is melody and bass lines. Every, everything else is filler. <laughs> but he, he was married to Ella Fitzgerald, wasn't he? He was. They, they, uh, they, they, they didn't need anybody else. They say you can't play simultaneously two people on Zoom, but we're about to do it. Yeah, for the first time in history. Yeah, and and there is a device that we use, and I like to use this when we're when we're playing live. You know, most people, they all, they, you set the tempo, and it's supposed to say that tempo for everybody throughout the whole song, and you stay together. Well, what we've discovered is you can still play jazz back and forth, even if there's a delay. You're just not quite, quite together, but you're certainly listening, and you're certainly reacting. And so it can be done on Zoom. Okay, and we're so about to do it, aren't we? Yes, but you're a good man for a story. Before you get up. Yes. You know Sheila Jordan. Very well, yes. One of my absolute favorite people. She's she, a, was, she was on the show. And I heard her play once at Foils in London. And she was playing in this huge cafe. And, and every time the coffee machine was making coffee, she sang a duet with the coffee machine. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar to what we're going to do. So it's never been done before live, and we're going to do it. Here we go. Bye-bye Blackbird on Zoom. With Paul Keller. Do you want to give me an F or should I just take it? Hi, you ready? Pack up all my cares and woe, here I go singing low. Somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, and so is she. No one here can love or understand me. my bed light the light I'll be home late tonight hey put it there pal <laughs> never done that before Here, here's one for you uh,
<laughs> that was a song by uh, Oscar Pettiford. Uh -huh. Not Oscar Peterson, Oscar Pettiford, the bass player. It was okay. called Laverne, Oscar, Laverne. Oscar Peterson's first cousin. <laughs> hey. So grab a seat. Grab a seat. That was a bit of fun. So, so, you know, they say that nice guys finish last. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and you're a nice guy. And, and you went on, uh, we'll talk about big band and all the stuff you're doing in, in, in but uh, what, what's this thing with my, you know, like I have this dream to sing one song with Diana Krall. You toured yeah. with her all over the world. Come on, man. What's that all about? Oh, that was, it was like touring with the president of the United States. Uh, yeah, lots. Of, actually, you know, at the very beginning when I was with her, it was just me and Diana and Russell Malone in a car. We would, you know, maybe uh, fly to uh, <clears throat> oh somewhere in Europe, and we would rent a car and we would drive around France or we would drive around Germany together. How did how did it happen? How did it happen? Uh, it happened because I was friends with Russell Malone, the guitar player. And I traveled a bit with Russell Malone. And we traveled all over the world, as a matter of fact. We played at this jazz festival here. This is such a cool poster. I'm going to show you this. All right. But don't forget to come back afterwards. I won't. Can you see that? Yeah. Nancy yeah. Jazz pulsations. Yeah, Nancy, Nancy is in France. It's a, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a jazz festival that we played there. I thought, um, I thought it was Nancy with a smiling face. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so I played with Russell for three or four years. And then um, and then when Diana Krall chose Russell to play in her trio, she said, do you have anybody in mind you'd like to work with? And he suggested me. And boom, that's it. So it's it's good to be a good player. But so who was it that said, uh, I'd rather be lucky than good? <laughs> Paul, I think, you, I think you need to be both. I mean, you are, a, so. you are, one second, you are a stunning bass player. Let's face it, you know, um, not everybody gets a lucky break, but, but you have to be uh, to, to, to have those levels where you're invited to play all over the world. You have to be really damn wonderful. And you are. So... Thank you. Re really nice. Yeah, I do believe in being prepared and, and, and being able to just turn on a dime and, you know, like what we just did, that Bye Bye Blackbird, just do it. You don't have to be locked into just the way that you thought you were supposed to do it when you were 17 years old. There's other ways to do it. Instead of 32 bars, it turned out to be 37 and a half bars and who cares? And who cares? Who cares? It sounded good and it was fun and it made me happy. Uh, you know, not to be selfish, but that is like my number one goal uh, when I'm playing music. I mean, sure, it's got to make me happy. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm hoping that it's making the other people on the bandstand happy. And I'm really hoping to connect with my audience. And I'm hoping that what we're doing and the way that we're presenting it, not just tune each tune, but the whole package. I hope that little journey uh, uh, makes people happy. Uh, I, we really like to mix it up and try to make people cry and then make people laugh and then make people swing and then amaze people and, and, and slow it down and speed it up. And you're, a real, you're a real showman. After, after I sang that song with Annie Selleck, you told, you told a joke. <laughs> Did know, I? Yeah. How many bases? You told the joke about Miss Levine, and how many how many people in, oh. the, in the middle of a <laughs> performance in front of a thousand people say, "Okay, Mel, before you go off stage, I want to tell a joke." <laughs> so li li listen, uh, Diana yeah. Crawl. Well, the first time I heard Diana Crawl, I, I went, "Oh my goodness, who is this? Who is this?" Um, and and you. You played with her and you toured with her. A, a couple of words about her. 
outstanding person, excellent taste. She, oh, one of the things I love about her piano playing is that she's right in, she's in the jazz tradition and the jazz language. And I won't say but, I will say additionally, she plays herself. She plays within herself. She, she Sure, she stretches, but she knows who she is. And, and if something simple and swinging is the right thing to do, then she will play something simple and swinging. And once again, it makes you smile and it makes you pat your foot. And it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. So she knows how to swing. I love that about her. It, it don't mean a swing if it ain't got that thing. Uh, <laughs> starting in G minor. For sure. For sure. Is that a cue? Strange you picked an Ellington song. <laughs> It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. It don't mean a thing. All you gotta do is sing. Makes no difference if it's sweet or hard. Give that rhythm everything you've got. It don't mean a thing, but it ain't got that thing. practice this <laughs> listen I want to show you something um, you chose that song and it's the first on my coffee table today oh there it is so how spooky is that that was just right on the tip of your tongue hey do you see this guy behind me yeah here comes Lewis Smith. Is that coming out the right way? Yeah. This was my good friend, Lewis Smith. He died oh, a few years ago, but I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with him. He lived in Ann Arbor, and that's I, I actually live in Saline, which is right near Ann Arbor, and we did quite a bit of playing together. I'm going to read to you the personnel that's on this record. This is a, his Blue Note record from 1958. Okay. With Doug Wat Doug Watkins, the bass player from Detroit, Tommy Flanagan, Ella Fitzgerald's piano player, and the piano player he, who was on Giant Steps. Uh, Duke Jordan is another piano player. He's on this. She loves ex-husband. And uh, uh, yes, yes. And uh, Arthur Taylor, love Arthur Taylor on drums. And it says Buckshot LaFunk which is a pseudonym for Cannonball Adderley. Wow, I didn't know that. So this record is loaded, and Lewis Smith, all of his life he played in the style of um, Clifford Brown, 
that kind of bebop uh, player, Blue Mitchell, Kenny Dorham. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was from Memphis, but he... Kenny uh, Dorham, uh, Blue Bossa? Yes. Wow. Yes. Just one of the great bebop trumpet masters of all time. But again, he chose to live in Ann Arbor and live a quiet life and play bebop, and he influenced a lot of people around these parts, including me. So, so Paul, you, you can play anything, um, but you have a real, I think you have a real romantic uh, touch to you. And um, yeah, you, you, I, wrote, I, you, you wrote somewhere that uh, you're a sucker for the great American songbook, as I am. Totally. And, and I'm giving a course now which I'm definitely going to invite you to be a guest on because it's on Zoom. Oh, okay. I'd love that. I, yeah. I, I would love studying. You're going to I mean, love studying, studying the uh, Great American it more. So it's a course called The Popular Music of the 20th Century from, from 1927 to 1980. And it asks one big question. And that question is, why do some popular songs seem to last forever? Um, you know, songs from the 30s and 40s what do they got what do you what do you have to have in a song that it was written 80 or 90 years ago and people still sing it are you asking me that yeah you're my you're like you're my guest today on the show oh my gosh that's that's a that's a mystery of the world isn't it we spend the whole semester talking about it yeah, because uh, because it's you're talking about uh, everybody's personal opinion and and also I I suppose sales go into that right. You yeah, know, but, it, I mean, but there's certain songs you know it, like the song. Yeah, I know, but but, but the, I want to say this too, that sometimes if if something is is fed to the public and and they buy it, then it becomes popular. So that begs the question that just because it's popular, does that make it good? Yeah, I don't. I, I, well, we're talking now about songs that are 80 years old, you know, that our, our grandparents heard on the radio, uh, that our parents grew up on, that we, sure. still, that we still love. I mean, Bye Bye Blackbird is probably from the late 1920s. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Um, Blue Sky is 1927. Um, uh, Summertime, 1935. Summer over the rainbow, late 30s. What, what do these songs have in your opinion? <clears throat> you don't have to answer me today. You can write to me. Oh, no. I have, I have plenty of thoughts that could probably last the entire semester. And I'm sorry. I apologize for, for going negative right away. But I do believe that one of the reasons that Somewhere Over the Rainbow... Well, we all know that one of the reasons that it was popular was that it was in the movie. And nobody's seen that movie for 50 years, though, Paul. Yeah, but they never would have heard the song without the movie in the first place. Okay, but there's lots of songs from movies that people forgot. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> you're you're, you're yeah. right. That's, that's, you know, it's like your story of the luck in me yeah. and Diana Krall. I'd rather, I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> so, like you said, with my career, I think the song has to be good, but you got to be lucky, too. I mean, hey, Mel, I, I just wrote 50 songs in the last four months, and I think they're all great. I really love, love playing them, but if a tree falls in the woods, does anybody hear it? <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, but you have to be lucky, but okay. But, but. Okay, so now back to why is that a good song? Here's one. By the way, by the way I, love your, I love your new song. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've been, I've been enjoying playing them. The problem is I hear them at three in the morning when I'm... <laughs> That's right. And then you wake up and you say, hey, I just wrote a new song and it sounds like this. <laughs> um. Hey, you picked a good song there, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, uh, because I think a lot of these popular songs from the uh, uh, from the 20s and the 30s that were meant to be sung 
they're sung within a certain range. And there's that octave somewhere. That's an octave. C, C, over the rainbow. Ah, da, da. It goes down below the octave. Da, ba. But basically, everything stays within an octave. So if, if your melody is like really rangy, or two octaves, that's not going to be a popular song because, well, look how everybody hates the the, uh, the United States National Anthem because it's so rangy. Nobody can sing it. <laughs> like for, for people who aren't musicians, you're talking about the lowest note in the tune and the, the highest note in the tune. Yeah, that's right. So if you start, oh, say, can you see by the dawn? Now you're going to go, and the rock and thread glad of it. It's too, it, it, it's, uh, the range of the song is... is yeah, that's stupid. because it was written by a sadist. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Jerome Kern said of one of his songs, uh, what was it? I think that maybe it was um, Nobody Else But Me. All of Jerome Kern's songs have a odd and wonderful, beautiful harmonic twist to them. And he said about that song, he says, it's too hip. Uh, the, it, it, it won't be popular. It's, so I think maybe there's a combination of some, some kind of harmony that, that is interesting, but not too crazy. Once it starts getting, I mean, it's a miracle that uh, all the things you are became as popular as it is because it had so many chords. I remember that he, he, he talked about that song. He said, this will never be a popular song because the, the harmonics are so complicated. Harmonics are so complicated, yeah. And yet, and yet people still sing it and love it. Yes, they do. So that's a that's a mystery, except that it, it, that we we love it and we all recognize that it's like one of the great songs of all time. Ba 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 ba. The melody goes in fourths, right? Da 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 da. Oh, it's really great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so okay, the, the words, the poetry of the words. That's that really tugs at your heart. It can be kind of a eh, okay song, okay melody, okay harmony, but if the words are great, we know plenty of plenty of country and western songs. What, what song came to your mind now? Like the, the song that came to my mind is like um, simple music and 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 lo lovely words. All of a sudden, the song that came to my mind was "Let's Fall in Love." Let's fall in love. Why shouldn't we? Oh, it's easy. Simple. Yeah. Simple. You know what popped into my mind? And this isn't necessarily romantic, but it is a juxtaposition of a happy melody and weird, strange, dark lyrics. Mac the Knife. Oh. Right? That's a happy song. That, 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 <laughs> da. But then the lyrics are all about this murderer. Yeah, that, that happens sometimes. Blood everywhere. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> so that's a, that's. Yeah, the, 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 uh, so, the, so if we're already talking about uh, sad songs with, um, so the song Softly is a very sad ballad. Softly? Yeah, softly as in the morning sunshine or oh, whatever. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. And uh, everybody plays it up tempo. Bee, bum, do, ba, ba, do, ba, bee, bum, do, ba, ba. But it's like, Softly as an I know, yeah. Well, I'm not against for jazz musicians for whatever purposes they want for their improvisation to change the song around. I do it all the time. But I like to do it from a place of enlightenment and not from a place of ignorance. Or, or novelty. Yeah, well, like you said, it's nice to be in touch with what does the song really mean? And that might give you an idea of how to play it if you if you know that. I mean, another one of our great heroes just died, James DePogny. I don't know if you knew James DePogny, but I learned so much from him on piano. Um, and he was a stickler for playing things or learning songs, 
especially songs from the 30s, in their original form. And then once you had that knowledge, now you can start changing it around. He, he would say the first rule of reharm, if you're going to reharmonize a song, he says the first rule of reharm is do no harm. <laughs> So he would always come from a place of knowing what the original harmony was. And sometimes we stick right with that original harmony and that's just fine. But it's okay to change it around if you're, if you're doing it from a place of enlightenment, not from a place of, it's all, always got uh, your, uh, your uh, reharmonization must support the melody. The chords have to be in sync with the melody. Otherwise, that, eh, eh, no good. For sure. Paul, I want to ask you now some, some personal things. Um, you are an extrovert as a bass player. Many bass players are kind of introverted because uh, people who don't understand music don't understand that if, if they're listening to a trio, the bass is really the most important instrument in the trio. The musicians realize it. They don't always acknowledge it. But um, the people in the audience, you are... Mm, only semi-visible. How do you, how do you, as such an outgoing guy, how do you live with that? Oh, oh, I'm very happy right where I'm at. Yeah, really quite happy. And, and that's, that goes for whether I'm a leader or a sideman, whether I'm playing modern jazz or Dixieland, which we are now calling uh, traditional jazz. Yeah. And uh, I am a, well, I actually, I call it prehistoric jazz. Lovingly, I call it prehistoric jazz. But I am a nut for Jelly Roll Morton and the Dukes of Dixieland and, and uh, Benny Goodman and, and before. Uh, Kid Ori, love that stuff. Yet I love this bebop guy right here so much. Um, oftentimes, I lead my own groups, and so... Bang, I'm in the front. I do the talking. It's really clear who the leader is. Um, and then I do a little a little guiding, a little a little uh, uh, nudging here one way or the other. But I enjoy being a sideman who sometimes I have to say to myself, Mel, who am I today? <laughs> right? Uh, what does, I, I, I need to get inside the mind of the leader. Like if Mel is hiring me, what does Mel want me to do? How can I make Mel happy? Because I don't really have an agenda. My only agenda is to have a good time making good music and get paid and, and, and get invited back. Because I did a good job. So I like to, I like to try to figure out, I don't want to fight that leader. But I also want to figure out, does he want me to keep my mouth shut and just play? Or does he want me to offer some suggestions? And so sometimes that's a little difficult if you're a sideman. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, every measure of every song that I'm ever playing, I got an idea for the next, for what's going to happen next. So I am ready. But one of my mottos is, just barge in and do it. Because if you don't, you're always going to be playing catch up. Yeah. But this, uh, this, this brings me to the last subject for today. The, the, one last thing about that. Sure. If you're smart enough and you barge in in, in an effort not to be, always be catching up, you'll, if you're smart enough and quick enough, you'll know when to pull it back. And so this barging in is, is, is really just more like confidence. You know, like you and I were going back and forth. We kind of knew when to go, and then I would jump in. You know, I don't mean barge in in a bad way. I just mean be ready to do something now at any second. Uh, the, the other thing is, for me, uh, jazz is a love fest between the members of the band. And, Absolutely. And... and um, and this is one of the things that I noticed about you is you have a lot, lot of tolerance, um, like playing with people who are different levels. Sometimes I, I saw that, I think, when you were giving a, a lesson 
to high school kids. Uh, you, you're a highly tolerant person in music. You know, sometimes you, you gig with somebody and they're looking at you the whole evening, you know, like, uh, what was that, you know? And you're, you're never like that. You're like an, an accommodating band member. Oh, well, thanks. Um, I have several things to say about that. Um, and that is, I've been on the other end of that and had had teachers that didn't give me what I, just they, they didn't support me in the way that lifted, I felt lifted up. And so I really try to, to do that with other people. And, and, and I get better results being positive and communicative than I do squashing people. I don't want to squash anybody because I know how that feels. It's no good. I've also learned a lot just from being around the great bass player and teacher, John Clayton. Mm -hmm. John is a very positive, uplifting teacher. And he'll always he'll he'll have a student play for them and he'll say, Wow, that was that was terrific. Good for you. Good job. Uh, now here are some other things that you might want to consider. He would never say, Don't do it that way. That was wrong. No. He would say he would be uplifting and positive and then offer suggestions for success. You can't always do that in the middle of a gig, though. No, you can't. Which brings me, so we're, 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 it's been fun, but we're going to have to close and, and continue later. Oh, you were right that we could just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Absolutely, and we will. Um, so I want to talk to you now for a couple of minutes about Big Band, where Big Band is, is a different kind of jazz. Yeah. It's not like, what am I going to play now? I can play whatever I want. It's my solo. I can barge in. I can barge out. But Big Band is very scripted. It's, it's almost classical music in a jazz format. Yeah. And we both of us love it. Why is that? Uh, well, for the swinging beat, for one thing. The swinging beat is the same as in a small group. For me, why I really like it is that it the melody lines are still using the jazz language, but now you're doing it with with all these other people and you have to write it down if you're going to do it with 10 or 12 or 15 people i mean it ha you, you can't that you, that can't be uh uh improvised so this whole thing of big band ensemble is something that i try to bring to my small groups i love the ensemble mel i love it when any two people or three or four or five or whatever can do something in the same rhythm, tutti. Uh, I that ensemble, to me, sets off the improvisation. And I, I, this is what I love about a big band: is there's plenty of ensemble, but uh, uh, there's it's balanced with uh, with some improv, some improvised solos. Right? There's always a tenor saxophone solo or a trumpet solo. Or my favorite big band charts always have some Count Basie piano solo in it. Right? Yeah. Or maybe they open it up for the drums or the trombone or whatever. There's always some good jazz in there, but that ensemble is what grabs me. Count bass. Yeah, I love the ensemble and the power. Boy, the power of the big band. That's also another reason yeah, we love it. When I, um, this is a long story, and I'm interviewing you today. But I dreamt about singing with, with a big band, and I did um, 10 or 20 times. And I, I liken it to uh, sitting on, on top of a jumbo jet that's taking off. <laughs> it's a lot of power. Yeah. Hey, Mel, will you come someday, I hope, to Michigan and sing with my big band? So you've read my mind. Yeah. And I'm going to cry in a minute. We never had this conversation, but I was about to ask you, in a year and a half, I'm turning 70. Oh. And um, this is one of my dreams, is to sing with your big band. Well, you know what? And you just, you just invited me. The world is going to be back to normal sooner than we think. I don't, I don't mean to be uh, dismissive or silly, but I'm an optimist. I believe in humanity. 
I believe things are going to be okay. You know, we just got to hang in there and be smart. Um, and when that day comes, our big band will start back up again. You will get on a plane on that jumbo jet and then come to Ann Arbor and get on another jumbo jet. And we're going to give you a big band ride with a new big band chart that I'm going to write especially for you. And I'll send you home back home to Israel with that chart. Okay, and I'm going to send you a chart of my song. Fantastic. Maybe we could even collaborate. Who knows? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? Hey, Mel, yeah. before, before we sign off, yeah. uh, I would like to mention that one of the things that I'm doing to stay busy uh, is I have little Facebook uh, barn concerts. I, I live in a, in a beautiful... Uh, uh, a beautiful farm here and we if it's raining we go in the barn if it's not if it's beautiful weather we go outside underneath the trees and we have concerts yeah. and i just do it on my iphone the the sound is pretty good you've seen some of them right yeah no it's great yeah 7 p.m um uh, that's eastern standard time so it's in the middle of the night for your folks in israel only 2 a.m but it gets re it re gets rebroadcast, so you can go to my Facebook page, uh, or maybe Mel. I don't know if you've got a group that you could forward those to sometimes, and maybe we I, can. I, I, I will. I will share it now. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'll be doing. What's today? Today is Wednesday. No. What is today? Today's Thursday, Paul. Today's here Thursday. I am, here I am agreeing with you. Every day is Saturday to me these days. <laughs> Uh, we're going to do one tonight, as a matter of fact, with my friends Carrie Kocher on Vibraphone and uh, Matt that. LaRusso. And then we're also going back to work in a safe way with masks, 50% oh. uh, capacity at the Blue Llama Jazz Club. And you can see us play if you go to bluellama.com or Blue Llama Facebook page. That's on Friday night. So Thursday and Friday night uh, at seven, both of them at seven o'clock. So, so put these in the feed underneath the video, and I will I will shout out also. Where do I on on this uh, on this okay, here? As soon as we go off, you can see on my feed, and also please share this with all your. I will, I will do it. Oh yeah, uh, we can share this on Facebook, right? Yeah, and uh, and you'll have it on YouTube also. Um, so Paul, this has been this has been a truly remarkable. Um, and I really, you know, I, I, I love great musicians, uh, but great musicians who are also great human beings. This is my all time favorite. So God bless you, man. God bless you too. Shalom. Give me five. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Until the next time we can hug each other and, uh, and jam together. Yeah. I'll look forward to that. Peace, okay. my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.